Welcome to Talking Giants, presented by SeatGeek. I'm your host, Bobby Skinny, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. We got ourselves a mailbag podcast. We're going to talk about Daniel Jones, Tyra Taylor, battle, future, all that good stuff. Um, Deontay Banks, the linebackers. There's a lot to talk about in this episode, Justin. How you doing? Hey, Bobby Skinner. Excited to see you this Sunday and see a whole bunch of people at our Talking Giants tailgate, click the link in our description to buy a ticket. And even if you can't come get a ticket, come hang out in L16 with us for a little bit. We're going to have a lot of fun. So we got some home games coming up. You know, this is the part of the schedule that even before the season, even before we got doom and gloom about the season, this is the part of the season that we were looking forward to and saying that I'm the Giants... I'm looking forward to it. I'm yeah. excited for ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, enjoy every Giants game, no matter what. But uh, this is going to be a huge, you know, this starting with this game on Sunday, it'll be huge. Like, hey, prove what kind of team the Giants maybe can be. Um, so I'm excited to see you. Excited to get back to MetLife Stadium. Couple home games coming up. Before we get into this mailbag, Justin, this episode was brought to you by some special people. Daniel Reckon Time. It's Reckon Time with Daniel. Al Sabelli. I mean, I'm pretty confident that guy owns a pizza uh, shop. Ryan Zachman. Not Zach Ryan, man, but Ryan Zach, man. Dennis Ventur- uh, Venturino, he owns a pizza shop, too. Brian Oliver, reminds me of Josh Oliver. Chris Hula- Hulahan, he's a hu- hooligan. Todd Heisenbuttle, Ty- Todd Heisenbuttle has no rebuttal to all the facts we're going to drop in this mailbag pod. Henry Shaw, he shall listen to the mailbag. Ryan Maisko, not Yusko, Maisko, and then we did. that's it. Justin, who are these people? And then that's it. Patreon.com slash Talk Giants. Thanks for all the new patrons, by the way. Even though the Giants are stinking it up a little bit, there's a bunch of people that still want to become part of the family, which is awesome. And you get to hang out with us live while we record the shows. Bobby Skinner will send you some stickers in the mail. And a couple times a month, there's a shirt raffle. So Patreon.com slash Talk Giants. There's some, there, there are, like, I, we didn't really promote it when it came out, but... There's a lot of cool, like, talking giant shirts, and they're, like, new added to the store, and they look pretty dope, uh, like throwback schemes, too. Patreon.com slash talking giants. Take it away, Steve. Mail time. Mail time. The mail's here. Come on. Bye, guys. Here's the mail. It never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. <laughs> Thanks, Steve from Blues Clues. Justin, let's get into the mail. Not you, Steve. Um, remember last week? And uh, Steve from the office was dressed like Steve from Blues Clues today. He had like a red and green. He had like a blue and green shirt on. He looked exactly like Steve. Anthony at G Men underscore Anth. He's asking one difference I noticed between Tyrod and DJ's play was that Tyrod was willing to take the deep shot more often and push the ball downfield. Was this an element of having Saquon back, or is Daniel Jones too fundamentally broken by the Jason Garrett scheme? I want to talk about this because I feel like there's been over overreaction, which, hey, happens. Tyrod wasn't, like, gunslinging it deep, right? Like, this offense, like, there's more deep shots than usual in this game. But the one throw where I will say there's a difference between him and DJ, or there's two throws. Uh, the, the one that didn't count. The, the one that didn't count the Hyatt. That's one where I will. I'm like, I don't th- think Daniel Jones is pulling the trigger on that. I really don't. I think he tries and scrambles and throw ends up throwing it away. I really don't think he does. And that, there is a difference in that. Um, and then at the end of the game, the fourth down, DJ is going to throw the ball deep. And then the third down, where I would agree that DJ doesn't throw that deep because he would have hit Wandale, who was open underneath. Um, Wide open. And the cover. Yeah, like, but the slot fades to Slayton because those were completed right. And like, hey, look, got some deep shots. Daniel Jones is throwing those passes 10 times out of 10. Those aren't just like, those aren't, those aren't dangerous throws. Those aren't post-snap processing. Those are, that passing concept, and if you watch the film review, was used a lot. And when they got it first man, they threw the slot fade with the single high safety. That's a throw that DJ is throwing 10 times out of 10 because that's a pre-snap. That's a pre-snap throw there, especially on third down. The only Um, question I'll ask you about that slot fade to Slayton, because it it worked twice, and they even tried it a third time late in the game, and Slayton just couldn't come down with it. We we've talked about on the on the show, and you know, there's some numbers that show that Slayton's been pretty good this year, separation wise. 
And I think that that kind of pro- this past game kind of proves it, where he was open a little bit on those slot fades. Why haven't we seen that a little bit more consistently this year? And if Slayton is you know kind of getting open, you know what? Why? Why? I'm not even saying that this is a DJ versus Tyrod thing. Why was Tyrod? Why was this successful versus the Bills versus not so successful the first part of the season so far? Because they haven't ran that passing concept. That's a new concept that they've been running, and they ran it like ten different times in that game. I'm serious. Like it was the most I think they've seen. They've ran one pass concept in a game. Um, it's called Shock, and I'm like actually gonna. I put a lot of it in the film review. I'm gonna make a shorter video out of it for tomorrow yeah. or today when people are listening. It's it's a shorter one, and we've seen DJ in the past throw that slot fade when it's there to yeah. Tate. Now the slot fade's not been part of it. Now DJ has thrown the ball deep to Slayton a few times this year, but he hasn't been able to connect. He's been the ball has kind of been to the outside, but. For the slot fade, that's there. So if you want to argue like, "Hey, DJ misses him," that's f- like, go at it. Yeah, you, you can't prove, you can't prove. Uh, I can't prove you're wrong on that. But he does throw that slot fade. That that play, yeah. it's pretty interesting. It's a it's a newer concept that they've added, uh, where it's essentially it's a hitch on the outside, the slot fade, and then a stick route. Uh, that's a pre snap read. That that's what DJ's good at. Yeah. where DJ we'll talk about it in the next question what DJ needs to grow out is the post snap stuff um which isn't even the Hyatt one it's just it's, it's I mean Ty, we'll do we'll hit it more in the question but Tyrell's a conservative quarterback too like he's not out here gunslinging no and I think the really this if when I look at the spray chart right I was hoping to maybe see to like answer this question hey is is Tyrod willing to push the ball down the field more than Daniel Jones what I what I would have said yes to is if Tyrod had more deep shots over the middle part of the field. Everything was by the sidelines, besides that fifty, you know, that forty-five yard high attempt towards the end of the game, where Wandell Robinson was wide open on a third down anyway. So that's a that's an L of a play. I don't consider that a success just because you're driving the ball down the field. That's a bad play because on third down you had a guy wide open and and you didn't get a first down. So if there were some more deep shots towards the middle part of the field. Then I'd be like, yeah, that's a that's an aspect that DJ doesn't really throw, and we talked about since last year he hasn't really thrown it at all under Brian Dable. Everything has been towards the sidelines, towards the sidelines. So I think it was about the same. It's just nice that we saw the play that didn't count the high at work, um, and then we, it's nice that we saw the two slot fades to Darius Slayton. It was nice to see those work, and I think that's what sticks out to people. Yeah, and I, I want to talk more about like this whole DJ Tyrod future question uh, stuff in the next question. Yeah. Um, but the one play is the the that hey Tyrod does this DJ probably doesn't is the Hyatt throw where he scrambles, and that's one thing that we talked about with Tyrod going into this game is that when Tyrod does get out of the pocket, that's a lot of times when he's looking to throw deep. Like that to that's what it, something clicks in his head where when he's scrambling, okay, this is where I can make my big play. Uh, where DJ is more like scramble and look for someone to come across the field. Yeah. Um, so according to um, Pro Football Reference, Tyrod had seven play action attempts, I believe, just from this game, unless he had any against Miami, and, and this is being counted in it, for a total of 51 yards. So part of this question, too, is is was having Saquon Barkley back, an element of having him back, did that help? Tyrod Taylor pushed the ball down the field. I'll even expand it out to, do you think it made, like, do you think that made, and this has been the age-old debate between analytics and maybe, you know, like, film people, do you think having Saquon Barkley back as an element helped out the passing game at all? Yeah, but n- not in the deep element of it. Right. Like, the deep element, it was, again, the slot fades, and the last two were end of game where they're not respecting run, and then yeah. the Hyatt one was... Was, was just not, a sick no. play. No, I, I there's like the you can ask like the Darren Waller twenty yard play. You could say Saquon made a difference there because the backside end they don't block it. He he chases the run and then they do that peel back block with the center with Bredesen and they're able to block it up a couple of times. So there there is elements to that, but specifically with the deep passes, no Saquon didn't make a difference in those. Okay, yeah, but that's why I brought up play action because uh, and it's nice to hear that there was a backside defender that wasn't blocked that didn't sack the quarterback for once this year and actually went after Saquon Barkley and went after the run. And that's what's supposed to happen, right? That's what's supposed to happen. Do you have anything else on this question? No, let's let's talk about more big pictures with these these two. 
All Blue at All Blue Giants. Is DJ the one to blame for the offensive lows? Even though Tyrod played about the same as DJ, the, the same as DJ many fans are calling for a QB change, is DJ's future with the Giants in jeopardy? I, I want to talk about his injury before we talk about play and stuff. Yeah. This podcast will be out on Wednesday, which we'll get the first injury report of the week. If someone who is not going to be having any type of contact in practice, right? If DJ is a, just a DNP and not a limited, like he could even be a threat to not play. The, he could even not play this week. But if he is a DNP this week, um, then I... I'm st- I get worried because it's the neck because we've seen the same thing happen before and the only difference is we don't have a carpenter's son to confirm it's done <laughs> like if you remember that year the three the, DJ was actually practicing yeah that week um so, so we were just waiting pra- waiting waiting and nothing happened. yeah he's pra- he's practicing less and then finally after a few weeks they're like they put out a release we're shutting him down the reporters never figured anything out it was the Giants who just tweeted out hey we decided to shut him down for the year um with a statement from Ronnie Barnes. Uh, if when this, I don't want to spend too much time because we'll find out more on the injury report. I, I, I get very worried. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm already there to, to be honest, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what the practice reports say. You know, I'm there with Andrew Thomas too, where after that, after that freaking Dallas well, Thomas game, not being on IR is just like, okay, it's a hamstring. It's tricky. That's what, yeah, yeah. Just after that Dallas game, there was like, oh, he's a sh- there's a shot he could play against the Cardinals, and then it's it, as the weeks have gone on, he's practiced less, which hamstrings are tricky. I get it went well, from they you practice don't... and then it had a setback. It, yeah, well, they, apparently they didn't have a setback from what the reporters say, but he had a setback. Like that's obvious. You don't go from practicing to not practicing without having a setback. Yeah, but we'll see with DJ with the with the reports. But just know that I'm I'm already there. Like I'm already there, kind of worrying about it. And you know, he even went on Kay Adams and said, yeah, I'm still having symptoms. So. <laughs> you know great so I, I want to talk about dj's future yeah dj's future is in jeopardy if the giants are in striking distance for a qb in the draft that they want that's what i think puts dj's future in jeopardy it really has nothing to do with tyrod taylor because again we have a one game sample size of tyrod taylor on the giants instead of judging him by the full body of work he's put together in the nfl and he right. played well but he's also had his versions of the dj seattle game and he's had them more frequently in his career. Um, and Tyrod's also a conservative quarterback like Daniel Jones, and they are differences. And if we just want to talk about, like, DJ played better in the Miami game than Seattle, than Tyrod did in the Bills game. But again, both of those defenses kind of played to what those guys do well. So I, I, I really am not going to get into this big DJ for first Tyrod debate. And even there being a debate is, is a knock on DJ. My gripe with DJ is that they put more on his plate and he didn't answer that. Correct. Right? And he played very well versus Miami. And I think they beat the Bills with him. I really do. I think you don't have that end of half gaff with the check, which by the way, I'm pretty I'm convinced that Tyrod Taylor thought they had a timeout by the way he reacted when the when the play was dead. Um and I think I just I just I think they win that game. Like the only reason they won it would be if DJ doesn't hit one check down to Wandale when they rush free, but even then they kick a field goal at the end of, end of that anyways. Um, but it's still not saying much because the defense only gave up 14 points. So it wasn't like, hey, I think they put up 31 with DJ. It was like, I think they put up 15 with DJ. Right. Um, is that even if DJ starts playing like he did last year, as if he comes back in the season, for me to really be like, hey, you know what? he should be here year three or they shouldn't draft a QB this off season. If they're in striking distance, he would have to operate a more complex offense. And after the first four games of the season, him not doing that well, will they even ask him to do that? Will they even ask him to do that? Because if they're not asking him to do that, you have your answer. It's what they did last year in a way, right? The offensive line was better last year. Obviously the skill position players are worse. But they were asking him last year to run a more complex offense, and guys were open. It's not like guys weren't open. Like Daniel Jones was passing guys up. It just it wasn't it wasn't just the right side of the offense line. It wasn't just the receivers. Guys were open, and Daniel Jones was passing it up. And here we are again having a similar conversation on Brian. You know, having you know Brian Dable and Mike Kafka taking things out of the playbook. Bobby, at the end of the day, man, last year was a pass a pass in a way. Because you did win games, 
you won a playoff game, and Daniel Jones did perform extremely well down the stretch. So it wasn't even a pass. Like I, he, he he earned it. DJ I, played I, well last year. Let's not pretend he didn't. Besides he did. the first two weeks of the season, he played well. He did, and and you you know I you know I agree with that. But at the end of the day, it is about results. And if you're paying a quarterback forty million dollars on you know a, a, AAV, forty million dollars, and your offense is going games on games, games on end without scoring a touchdown. Or even last year, this is the same thing last year, where your offense is bottom of the bottom of the barrel and explosive play rate. When I've been talking for years, that is the one stat that translates to wins and losses. That's the one stat I, that I think translates best in the NFL to wins and losses outside of points scored and points allowed is your explosive play rate on offense. And if this is how many years in a row now, two years under Brian Dable with good coaching, where you're bottom of the barrel and explosive pass play rate, and you're paying this quarterback $40 million, sorry, it, it can't fly. They still do need to fix the offensive line, yes, but that, that can't fly for me. So it, it's not Tyrod Taylor versus Daniel Jones. It's Daniel Jones versus his inability to score points and run an effective offense. That That's Daniel Jones' biggest enemy right now, not Tyrod Taylor. Well, yeah, and, and Tyrod put up nine points, you know. It's not like he came yeah. out and, and let it – like again, it's it's a not it's, this has nothing to do with Tyrod to me and that game. It has all to do with Daniel Jones. And again, with this offensive line, they're not going to be a top ten offense, but they shouldn't be thirty first or thirty second. Correct. Um, you know, where last year they were fifteenth. They played easier teams, but they were fifteenth. Like they should top twenty at the worst yep, with the I personnel agree. they have and paying a quarterback forty million dollars at the worst. Um, and. Again, there's there was there's it's not just oh well, offensive line. There has been things that he that they put on his plate that he has passed up this year, and then you have the Seattle game where it's a disaster, and now dealing with injury. Like again, for me to to say okay, now like it, like if the Giants to say the Giants just shouldn't be in the quarterback market, right? They may they may not get a QB this offseason, but just to say going to this offseason saying they should not entertain that. DJ would have to play well, but also play well doing bigger things and not just right. playing well like he did last year. Taking the right. step forward, you have more weapons, you have more complex stuff. That's what it would have to be. It cannot just be playing the style. Like, and I, I think Daniel Jones is more like the quarterback he was last year than he is this season. But it that's last year's quarterback doesn't stop you from going and upgrading, no. which again is what we talked about on the, if you go listen to the, the pre DJ contract and post and then him signing the contract episodes on that is this is the thing holding us back from being like, this is why he's getting a mid tier contract and not a top tier. Um, and this contract should not stop you from getting someone. If you think that's the right decision, which is kind of, we didn't think we'd be in this situation, this conversation so quickly, but we are. Yeah. And if you're yelling at home being like Bobby, Justin, you're killing Daniel Jones because you, you can't do anything without an offensive line. And while I agree, but the whole argument, and Bobby hit it the nail on the head, the whole argument it is, is that, yeah, the Giants need to fix their offensive line. This is this is worse offensive line play, you know, but pre-Justin Pugh. Worse offensive line play than we did see in 2021, because at least 2021 for the large majority of the season did have Andrew Thomas. But it should not be this bad. The Giants are 31st right now in offensive EPA per play. Let me give you the teams 20th through 24th because Bobby mentioned that 20th number. Let me give you the teams ranked EPA per play, and this is almost like an efficiency power rankings. That's what I consider EPA per play to be. The Saints are 20th. Derek Carr has not been very good, and they have offensive line issues of their own. The Arizona Cardinals are 21st. The Indianapolis Colts are 22nd. Bum-ass Josh McDaniels is 23rd, and that Raiders offense. And 24th is the Chicago Bears. EPA per play offense, not team. This is just offensive EPA per play. I don't with even the bad offensive line that the giants have this year. I would never expect their offense to be worse than the saints, the Cardinals, the Colts, the Raiders and the bears. Now yep, you got to be better than that. You should be better than that. Those guys yep. have offensive line issues as well. All right, Justin, next question. Next question comes from Nico Risen. Can your can your read an ad, please? That's an interesting way to word it. Well, there's subscriptions for everything these days. There's even a subscriptions for Talking Giants, which hey, I got I can't I can't lie. If you're 
if you got a subscription and you don't want to do it anymore, but you're too like you haven't been able to figure out where to cancel it, you should you should do this. From streaming services to fitness programs to talking giants, and sometimes it feels impossible to keep tabs on what you're paying for every month. That's why I'm such a huge fan of Rocket Money, and and partly why I'm not a fan of Rocket Money. Like I bet you we've got some subscriptions canceled to Rocket Money, but it's too good of a product and has helped me personally to where I cannot. I got to help the people. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one single place. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the ones you don't want with just the press of a button. No more long hold times or annoying emails with customer service, which is the worst thing possible. Rocket Money does all the work for you. Rocket Money also lets you monitor all your experiences in one day. Uh, uh, recommends custom budgets based on your past spending and they'll even send you notifications when you reach your spending limits they're gonna rock it like rocket fuel with over 3 million users and counting rocket money customers have saved an average of 720 dollars a year you can you can get you can buy some rocket fuel with that money you can rock it with rocket fuel stop wasting money on things you don't use cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash giants that's rocketmoney.com slash giants rocketmoney.com slash giants rocket like rocket fuel you'll be glad you did slash giants just the next question next question is coming from nyg forever at nyg forever underscore you're damn right how do you feel about the Giants linebackers moving forward? Has Micah McFadden emerged as an improving player from his 2022 play? And do you feel Okereke has become more comfortable in Wink's scheme? I definitely will say yes to that second question. Dude, Okereke played on fire Sunday night, right? Like 11 tackles, two passes defended, one uh, turned into an interception, a forced fumble, and two tackles for a loss. What I really loved, though, was the quick trigger for some gap runs, Yeah, right? Like, the coverage plays were the best and most important things that he did, but where I've always had confidence in him as coverage, I've always had confidence in him versus zone runs, versus gap runs, that's where I've been like, come on, man, you got to have a little quicker trigger than that, and then open field tackling, which didn't really happen in this game. But having a quicker trigger on that, because it just makes so much, it makes everyone else around you better. I will say. we saw that, and that was very, that was encouraging. You you said not, not a ton of open field tackling. I thought one of the more impressive things... He made it look easy, but bringing Josh Allen down in the open field and really keeping up with him in the open field, which that's how so many big plays happen for quarterbacks like Josh Allen, who they're so good out in space. So bringing Josh Allen down in the open field, so it, it, it wasn't a ton. It didn't define his game, but I thought on those plays where we talked about his job was having that like QB spy responsibility. It would almost look like he'd be running a stunt But then instead of pursuing and running to the outside, Bobby, and like trying to really go upfield, he would kind of just sit and he would watch and he would watch Josh Allen after initially starting at the A gap. So yeah, really impressive. I I do think like just seeing how Okereke has played over time, and we questioned his awareness, we questioned his you know his recognition skills. I, I'm hoping that it's the comfortability in the Wink Martindale scheme now that he's here. I'm hoping that that is unlocking his play recognition and how fast he plays, right? I'm hoping. I, I hope that too. And again, I, I need you need to see it more consistently because yeah. this was the same. This was like the drawback to his game in Indy too. It's like, hey, coverage good, zone runs good, speed, athleticism good, strength good. Even though he's not the greatest at like stacking and shedding blocks, but he's solid. It's being quick trigger on those gap type runs and again there's more put on his plate because he's got more coverage responsibilities but if he starts processing these run plays more consistently then man we got ourselves a freaking linebacker like we've already had a good solid linebacker but we've got a really good like a huge advantage type linebacker if he can do that type of stuff but i i I gotta see it more consistently on a week-to-week basis before just going off of one game right um because i mean that's just that's just football in general you can't yeah. you can't use a one game sample size for anything and basically forcing two turnovers as well did he help force any turnovers against the dolphins where they had three he had an interception and he created the pick six for his pinock so i mean that's four inter- that's four turnovers that he's basically unlocked for this giants defense over the last two weeks that's fucking insane yeah <laughs> It's crazy. Like the, the intercept, the Giants have three interceptions this year: a Bobby Okereke interception, and then two Bobby Okereke uh, passes tipped up. If the Giants have a functioning offense, 
the Giants maybe win both of those games. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Dolphins did have a lot of yards and a lot of points, but, you know, Giants offense can't score, which therefore I think hurts the defense a little bit. But these last two weeks, if the Giants somehow pull off victories or at least against the Bills with a functioning offense, it's like Bobby, we're, we're like singing Bobby O'Karake's praises for forcing four, helping force four turnovers over the last two weeks. Cause that's crazy stuff. We don't, we don't see that. It's like a crazy r- little run that he's having. I'm actually going to do that tweet right now. No, don't, don't take my tweet. Don't take my thought. Bobby, you didn't even know if he had turnovers versus Miami. I, well, I, it Giants was my- have three interceptions this season. Bobby O'Karake, Bobby O'Karake tipped up the mob, McFadden. That's Bobby O'Karake up. tipped up to Jason. That's really messed up. I had the thought. Pinnock. Four. I asked for clarification. A pick six. You 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 got to you got to have better game recall. Did uh, he have? Did he did he contribute any turnovers versus Miami? Oh, you only know, every single one of them. You know I have a bad memory. <sighs> That's that's a you issue, not a me issue. Um, and then True. McFadden has been playing with a very quick trigger this year, and it's a convert. Like we talked about it last year in off season, where I was like, I feel like he would play a lot better next to someone not named Jalen Smith, and he has. Now McFadden had all those. That Arizona game was a disaster for McFadden, where he missed all the tackles and coverage miscommunications. Now he still struggles in coverage. Like McFadden is not great in coverage. But McFadden's been a, a halfway decent inside linebacker too, and he's kind of he's got a little more of the green light to go. Where OKRK has more coverage responsibilities and and can't be as downhill as McFadden, and that's that's the that's the benefit of playing next to OKRK uh, instead of Jalen Smith. But McFadden doesn't stop you from upgrading, right? He's no. he's a, like he's a solid piece, but he doesn't stop you from upgrading. You know who I think has also been low key. Good at linebacker, even though he has uh, very limited reps there, Justin. I'm guessing it's the other one, and that's Isaiah Simmons. No, it's Xavier McKinney. Oh, you throw a I wrench knew you at would me. Say Isaiah Simmons, and I knew all the listeners in their head. You don't lie to yourself, listeners. You thought I was going to say Isaiah Simmons, and Simmons had some good plays too. But it's been Xavier McKinney when he's at linebacker. Yeah, yeah. He, we already we we talked about it in the game recap that he had some nice tackles. Did you see any like? Plus coverage plays from McKinney. He had a, he had more than a few, I think, nice tackles and run stops. But did we see any plus coverage plays from McKinney? I think he had an open field tackle on somebody, a tight end. He didn't have any bad plays, but he didn't have any uh, outstanding plays either. They did this weird coverage thing, and I'm. It, it didn't lead to really anything, but they would put McKinney at corner, and oh. then they would just have the corner just stack ten yards on top of him. And then they would get into they. It was just kind of disguising some of their zones, but it was always on Stephon Diggs. And I want to talk about the Bills game plan with Diggs and all that coming up in a question. But uh, now there was no like plus, plus, like oh, this is a great McKinney play in coverage that popped up, which is a good thing and also yeah. not a bad thing either. It's a it's a good thing that we're not saying his name in a bad way. Where Xavier McKinney allows a big play, so I'll take that. Plus, he made some nice tackles and some nice plays in the wrong game in the box, which is great, versatile. Uh, next Actually, question. he did have one bad play. It was that end of the game. He got beat on the that play action. Oh no! Where where Knox where Allen kind of hit the front of the rim. Take everything Chris back. Collinsworth. Take everything back. Uh, Dougie Fresh, Dougie Fresh eighty six. We all know cornerback is one of the hardest positions for a rookie to grasp right away. How has Deontay Banks improved since day one, and is he already CB one? Bobby, you. We asked the people to ask us about Deontay Banks, and they're coming through. He's not CB1. That's Adore, um, even though Adore hasn't played to the level that he played the last two seasons. Um, the Buffalo Bills game isn't the one I'm going to draw from to be like, oh, Banks has really improved. Because honestly, Allen was basically just stuck on Diggs, right? And anytime Banks got a matchup with Diggs, they would double him. Um, and they played more cover three, which is an easier for a young corner. But he's doing what they ask of him very, very well. And I think the thing that I've been the most impressed with, Banks, is is the thing that I was the most worried about, right? Being very good at the release, right? Not mistiming his jams, which, again, you saw some of those earlier in the season. But the last couple, you haven't seen him mistime jams and then have to play from behind. Um, And that was one was my biggest worry of him at Maryland. 
Um, where it's like, but in Maryland, it's like he kind of had the speed to recover and he's, he's done well here, but also in camp, right? Like that first week of camp was extremely ugly. And it was basically all based off of the release, losing the release. So they really coached him up on that. And that's the, one of the benefits of having Jerome Henderson. Um, so they're not asking a ton out of him right he's not covering wide receiver one he, you know they're letting him get in they're giving him some help um but he's looked good in zone passing stuff off like he hasn't been lost in zone so yeah i don't think they're asking him to do a ton but he has done his job like very well the the thing that i after six games where i say i'd want to see improvement in this is at the catch space yeah yeah, like because one, you, you had a dropped interception versus the 49ers. Ronnie Bell, seventh round rookie, who beat him for a touchdown in college too, beat him for a touchdown. It's being being better at at the catch space because we haven't even really seen like the pa- like not just not interceptions or anything. We haven't seen like the pass breakups. Yeah, like forcing an incompletion. That's not something that that we've seen. I want to see has he forced an incompletion? He's had two pass breakups. So far this season, a PD I, or a PBU, a, P, a PBU, a pass breakup. Okay, so, so one has, would be the 49ers, the Debo, and the first drive of the game where he dropped the interception. Yeah, uh, maybe one versus Dallas week one, one against Miami last week. Okay, um, and then uh, as of right now, this is according to PFF. If you want to check Pro Football Reference uh, on how many pass deflections he has, uh, he's allowed 13 receptions. 25 targets, 52% completion rate, 120 yards, 9.2 yards per reception. There were two games, the Dallas game, he only played 25 snaps. And then 61 snaps this past week. He was targeted three times, no receptions. But like you said, I I, I rewatched kind of just looking at where Deontay Banks is going. They they weren't asking him to do a lot. And even when like Stefan Diggs, he was covering Stefan Diggs, it was a lot of kind of like underneath stuff and quick stuff. So um, but those numbers are elite. Those are great numbers. Those, yeah, those are good numbers. Uh, now, uh, here's my question to you. Darnay Holmes, I remember Darnay Holmes' is rookie year. I know the uh, slot versus outside corner, but you, you'll understand the question when I ask it. Darnay Holmes' is rookie year. Thought it was a fairly easy assignment that he got, which is, hey, keep everything in front of you. We're going to play you off. We're not going to press you at the line. We're not going to ask you to do a ton all that we're asking you to do is not let people get behind you and play the flats and play whoever's in front of you. That's the scale of having a somewhat easy assignment as a corner. So let's put Deontay Banks on the scale of prime uh, Darrell Revis, Revis Island, your 1v1 versus somebody, versus Darnay Holmes' rookie year. Where does Deontay Banks' assignment fall in that kind of category? Like a six, I guess. I mean, he's still playing man coverage and being trusted to not get beat deep and stuff, which he hasn't done, um, right? Um, yeah. And even when he has got beat it deep, it hasn't been bad and hasn't give a QB like, oh, this is his beat. You got to go after him. And he has looked pretty comfortable in press, right? The, honestly, one of the biggest issues is being let go after five yards because there's been a few times where he's gotten penalties for that. Um, so, yeah, when I say he's not, at, they're not asking a ton. It's like, there, they, you know, there's some protection there, but they're, but it's not like you said, it's not Darnay Holmes and a Patrick Graham scheme in the right. nickel, where it's, again, where you're just, you're playing curl hook and flats. Yeah, yeah, I have been impressed with his ability at the release because you know you you can lose a play at the snap of a finger like that, and quarterbacks and good quarterbacks, we have played a lot of good quarterbacks this year. Good quarterbacks will recognize that shit right away, especially with good receivers, and we've played a lot of good receivers this year as well. So. Uh, Credit to Deontay Banks. We talked about it on the post uh, on the post game pod that reaction. Like, listen, you know, he's not doing anything extravagant. But what we thought heading into this year is we were a little concerned about that twenty fifth pick, and it's like, are you really going to trust a a rookie corner to hold shit down? And yeah, he's he's holding stuff down on a defense that is allowing a decent amount of big plays, and Deontay Banks has not been allowing those big plays. Uh, yeah. Bobby Skinner, you ready get for the better next... and run support too? That's been a yeah. big thing. Yeah, I haven't seen him really make a tackle. But um, uh, it's, he's a rookie corner. I'm, I'm going to focus on coverage more so than run support. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you ready for the next question? Next question. I'm going to go a little bit of out of order. I'm going to read an ad. Jensky at Jensky underscore. Read an ad. You'll be glad you did. Oh, certainly. We'll be glad 
We did. You'll be glad that you go to the DraftKings Sportsbook because we're back with another week of football and DraftKings Sportsbook is keeping us in on the NFL action with great offers every single game day. New customers can bet $5 and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Throw five down on any of this week's epic matchups to walk away an instant winner. Huge matchups this week, by the way. It's the Eagles and the Dolphins, and then there's the Ravens and who? Who are the Ravens playing? Who are the Ravens playing? Who are the Ravens playing? Shh. The Lions. They're playing the Lions in Baltimore. So I'm really, really excited for those two games specifically. DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. Football's more fun when you're in on the action. So download the app now and sign up with the code WORLD. New customers can bet just $5 to get 200 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL with code WORLD. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777. Visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. Licensee partner Golden Nugget, Lake Charles, 21 plus age, varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. See sportsbook.com, DraftKings, see sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms with eligibility terms and responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Bobby Skinner, you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad you did. Next question. Next question is coming from Josh at tackle for loss underscore great user. Do you guys think it's a big deal that Dable tends to chew out his quarterback in front of the cameras? No, I love it. And he's a player's coach too, (laughs) behind the scenes. And, and, and... QB of all positions has to be able to handle that. Like, yeah. if you can't handle that as a QB, then I don't want you as my QB. And yep. DJ and Tyrod are both big boys and pros who can't handle that specifically. Specifically, those two guys. They're as mature and professional as it gets. Um, if you had a young QB who's a little bit of a pussy, maybe one thing. But those two guys are definitely not that. Dable also did this with Allen quite a bit, and I think it helped him. Um Wide receivers, DBs, you have to be a little more fragile with them, right? Um, but as long as he's not like just throwing players under the bus to the media and not, I don't consider just saying, hey, yeah, we there was a confusion with like the Tyrod end of the half thing. I, I don't seeing that. So as long as he's not throwing players under the bus to the media and specifically non quarterbacks, um, then I have no issue. I, I want my co- coaches doing that. Like, I, I'm going to get old head. Poor, but did, what, would we be concerned if Parcells or Coffin was? Like, sorry. I, I, I love it. I love it. I don't think it's an issue. It's an issue for, for people in the media who like to, you know, look for something to criticize. Yeah. I, I, I love it. Yeah, I, I think this is simple for me, where we want a coaching staff, we want an organization, we want a regime that – it doesn't matter who you are, right? You're going to be held accountable. That's That was the talking point last year. Oh, Kenny Galladay's getting how many millions of dollars? Well, he's on the bench. This coaching staff and this regime is going to hold everyone accountable to how they play regardless of how much you're getting paid. And it's the same thing with the quarterback. It's the same thing with the quarterback. Um, if there's a player that's performing like shit and you feel the need to rip him a new asshole, yeah, I mean, that that's the, that's the difference between winning and losing the game right there. So I, I would agree. Like, it's different in front of the media which Dable doesn't do that. Dable doesn't give anything to the media. But in the moment, like if you're mad and if a player fucked up, like it's no different from what you see, you know, a coach doing at the college level, high school level, and nobody bats an eye when when they're doing that stuff. And and nobody's batting an, batting an eye when it's any other position. Um, I feel like that's what we should want as fans, having a coach that holds players accountable. Doesn't matter who you are, what position you play. So where that, you get in it. trouble is like the McGahee glare, right? <laughs> yeah. That's where you kind of got to be a little careful um, in front of cameras because that becomes a, like if that was if that was wink, right? Oh, then that's a much bigger story. If that's not the special teams coordinator who we all can't stand, it becomes like, hey, I glare at a stupid ass, too. But if that's wink, um, that becomes a bigger story and that can kind of trickle down into the players a little bit. But specifically quarterback. No, I got no problem with it. There, diff, there's different. You treat different people different ways, but quarterback and especially the two quarterbacks the Giants have on the roster right now, um, I've got no issue and I actually like it. So no, I, I'm not worried about it. Next question, Justin. Next question: As the lights 
turn off in the studio every 40 minutes. Uh, so I had to get up. Next question is coming from Life Definitely Been Life and Man. Wow. At Bearded Lumby. Do you think the defense was successful due to Wink's game plan slash play calling, or did Dable's insight into Josh Allen and Buffalo give the defense everything they needed? Bobby, I, I think it's like a combination of the two, and I'm upset. I, I like had this thought on Sunday because um, I do think that Brian Dable's insight into especially – I would say the blocking schemes and maybe how the offensive line moves and maybe how to generate uh, some pressure and make Josh Allen uncomfortable. I thought that Dable's insight into that aspect of things, I definitely think that did help. Um, well, Wink has had a lot of success in the past versus Allen. It held him to 10 points in a playoff game. True. Uh, I think the biggest thing from the Giants side was one, doubling digs a lot. And then Okereke just playing the way he did. If I am cover one this week, I am kind of a little ticked off with Allen and their offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey. Like, Allen, one, had a bunch of bad reads. He tried to force the ball to digs too often. Like, he had 16, I think it was like 16 targets to digs and like 13 to other t- players. And digs had 10 catches. The rest of the team had nine catches. And they kept in max they kept getting in max protection or not max protection or keeping extra tight ends and stuff and the giants weren't really blitzing like that so you had less like players occupying defenders and the giants were able to double team a lot of stuff um so i i i i think it's a mix of like bills kind of had a bad game plan getting really worried about uh, that stuff and then josh allen also had some really bad decisions like there's a a little mesh play where josh allen is just staring at Stefan Diggs, who has three players around him, and Khalil Shakir is just wide open. Mm. And it's and it's a two it's there's a clear out route. So it's you're you can only throw the essentially throw the ball to two players. And the clear out re- route has an easy read where it's you're not gonna alert and throw to it. And he just gets stuck on Diggs when it's like Khalil Shakir is wide the fuck open, dude. Yeah. Um so I th- I thought it was a mix of a couple things. You know, the 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 interception was a f- uh, forcing the ball into Stefan Diggs. Um or no, the uh, pass defection, the, the interception was a different play. Um, that was a really good play by OKRK. So I thought it was the big, the, the OKRK doubling digs and the Bills not really game playing the Giants correctly. Yeah, Josh Allen had a negative CPOE, which you don't see that too often, negative 2.2 CPOE, um, which is in the 39th percentile. I also. I would be a little bit, little bit frustrated at uh, Ken Dorsey too if I were the cover one guys. Um, I want to talk about series conversion rate. Series conversion rate is the rate at which a series starting on first down earns a new first down or a touchdown on that series. So there was 29 series that the Bills had um, this this past Sunday. 11 of them started with the pass for a success rate of 54.5 percent. 18 of them started with the run. Started with the run with a success rate of 88.9%. I think they should have went to the run a little bit earlier. I think they should have went to the run a little bit more often because finally when they did go to the run in the second half, that's when you saw them churn out those seven-minute, eight-minute drives that you know both of those went for touchdowns. The Giants also gave a lot more light boxes in the second half, and I think Ken Dorsey kind of lives by, like, hey, if it's run, we'll, if it's light, we'll run. If it's, if it's stacked, we got Josh, Josh Allen, and we're not going to run it. Um, so I think that went into it a little bit and they did have success for those light boxes. The stack box is not as much. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was just an off game from Buffalo too, but the giants, okay, okay, doing what he did, doubling digs. Um, they did. And even the, even that first touchdown, the crazy one or the that was the second touchdown, the giants manned up across and it was great man coverage. They just, Allen just makes plays with his legs. And there was multiple times where like most quarterbacks get sacked. Um, so Allen, even in that, had the superhero moments in it where if it's any other quarterback with that game plan and the, the other bad plays, the Giants might have shut them out. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, and maybe, hey, maybe that is some insight. They ran more cover three than they usually do, but that's kind of a form of cover one. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much Dable had to, to fully do with it just because that's – I mean, there's insights, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, basically like teams have been trying to like, Oh, dink and dunk on us, Josh Allen. And Wink was like, no, nah, I'm going to go after you a little bit. 
uh, which I, I thought worked. All right, Justin, next question. Next question is coming from Chris at Life NYG. Is there a chance both Pew and Collins get signed to the team? I'm guessing this is well, Layal Collins. Layal Collins. I was thinking, or why are we talking about um, what's his name? Landon Collins. Yeah, I'm like, why are we talking about Lando Collins? So we're talking about Collins, the offensive lineman. Is there a chance both Pew and Collins get signed to this team? If so, what's the five you have starting when everyone is healthy? I'm kind of ignoring the Leo Collins part of this question. Just I want to talk about Pew. What do you think of the Justin Pew PR machine? Because it's very one of the more evident. Like we're pushing stuff. To, the, did you see the Adam Schefter tweet the other day? Yeah, I want to read it because it's just so gave funny. the whole summary. Like thank Which you. I thought was fun. And I almost I quote tweeted it with like thank you for this informative. Uh, post and the initiative to tweet it and, and I almost said like is there maybe a t-shirt that you could link me to and, and I look in the replies and he actually had a link to the t-shirt yep. the tweet was um, where is it come on Johnny if the, if the, jo- if the Giants, Giants O-line me. Justin Pugh went from straight off the couch to straight to the fire he expected to play left guard but due to in game injuries was moved to left tackle where he had played 6 snaps his entire career the plan was for him to play 25 snaps Sunday night he wound up playing 77 after spending the past year recovering from a torn ACL and being signed to the practice squad about 10 days ago. He didn't know cadence for the game, so he had to guess many times due to being on the practice squad and being elevated. He is technically a free agent and could sign with any team. Um, Listen, I, I respect Pew for having the, hey, I want to, I, I will come on the practice squad. But I want to have a conversation about a real contract when it comes time to add me to the 53. But I am not going to, after that one game, be like, okay, let's give this guy a real big contract. We still have two more practice squad elevations. Use them. He did give up two sacks in this game. And again, I'm not losing my mind on that. But I thought Pew played with really good technique. But there is some still questions about, like, does he have the strength to hang, right? Can, can that, that, was, that was both at left tackle, right? Left tackle and left guard. Um right. You know, the sack. Yeah, the sacks were at left tackle. Um, he did have even, some negative. He had like some, uh, like that first series, he had like a negative play at guard where he, where he allowed like a tackle for loss, right? Yeah. And then, you know, even like he had really good technique on his like one true yeah. pass at a guard, but he did get beat inside. So you see good technique. You see good hands. You see what's made him a, a, a first round pick and a well paid vet in his career, right? And I think Pew should be starting and should be on this team. But I am not, despite the PR machine being like, okay, give this guy a long-term contract. Like I would like to see one game, uh, more than one game and maybe don't give up two sacks in it either. Like I, I understand. F- I'm, I think it's a valiant effort. Um, but the giants shouldn't be rushing to give him a contract just because Pew wants a contract. I think there's a fine line. I think there's a fine line between giving him a $3 million deal for this year, just to keep him on the team. And, also recognizing that the 2023 New York Giants offensive line desperately needs Justin Pugh. They, yes. they, they desperately need him. Like I, I think there's a fine line and it, so he's tech. He technically can be signed by another team. Correct. Yes. If, if the Giants get an indication that Justin Pugh wants to go elsewhere and that he's going to go elsewhere, I think the Giants n- I don't know if this is legal or, or what, but the Giants need to be checking in, being like, what's the money they're giving you? If it's that something is that... And those are the conversations that are happening right now. Perfect. And- uh, so it, they need to keep an eye on, if there is another team that wants to scoop in and add Justin Pugh to the roster, they need to keep an eye on how much that contract is and if it would be worth it for the Giants, because maybe it would, to match it, go above it, keep him in New Jersey. I, I, to be honest, I don't think t- any team is swooping in to give them him more than the minimum, uh, at least this part of the season, too. Here's where you got to be careful with it, though, is that not be careful with it, but where you could get into a little bit of a bind. Usually these practice squad vets, they get their elevations, then they get a minimum, a vet minimum contract. I see Pew having the willingness to be like, hey, I'm not taking a vet minimum. Like I will do these practice squad elevations, but once that's over and you want like you don't have the option to you can't you can't just say, Oh, we want to see you play a couple games, elevate you from the practice squad. Once it comes times where they either have to sign him to the active roster or 
not play him, which again, there's no reason for him not to be starting on this team with the with the guards they're putting out there. And especially if, you know, Zudu's on IR, you need him at left tackle. There's that's where I can see Pew having this the willingness, but like, no, I'm not I'm not signing the vet minimum. Because the Giants are gonna try and get him to sign the vet minimum contract and they're gonna play that. How who is willing to play more hardball? Will Pew just fold and be like, you know what? I will play on the vet minimum. But I, I also see him having the personality and the strength to be like, no, nah, I'm not. Sorry. You, you, we said we'd have a conversation. I don't like the way this conversation is going. I, I don't, I don't need to come here and play for the vet minimum. I, I I'm, I'm good. So that's, that's where it's going to be really interesting. And that won't happen for at least another week. Yeah. But he needs to be on the team. Like Marcus McKeithen and Mark Owinsky cannot be playing over Justin Pugh. No, and definitely not McKeithen. No. No. You know, when JMS comes back, he's at center. Bredesen's at one of the guard spots. Confident Ben Bredesen is a better guard than Justin Pugh, but Justin Pugh is a better guard right now than Marco and Skane Mar- or Marcus McEthan. Well, and Pugh has, like, Pugh can be a better guard than Bredesen still. Um, and Bredesen has sucked at center. We got to get him out of center. Uh, that's that's We need JMS back to have him back and also to get Bredesen out of center. Look at that. Uh, he's not a center. But... um. Pew, Pew obviously belongs. Pew absolutely deserves to be starting on this team and should be starting. Yeah. All right. What? So, what is your quick healthy five? Mine is Thomas Pew, JMS, Bredesen, Neil. I I just want to leave Pew at left guard. Let's keep him happy. We've already, yeah. you know what? We already dicked around Bredesen, dick him around a little more, moving to the right side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm. I think I'm fine either way at guard. Would you want it? Would you want to give Evan Neal more of a veteran presence at right guard? Somebody that could pass off stunts. There, you. I, I watched the O line report. There was a nice little. No, I'm sorry. That was was that Glowinski and yeah, it was Glowinski and Pew. Pew was at left tackle, and yeah. they passed off a stunt nice to each other. So, um, and that was that was Pew the one that did that. It wasn't like Glowinski did a great. Like Glowinski did his job, but it was Pew that the one who ID'd that. So he put, Pew wants to play left guard, put him at left guard. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, if he says that he wants to play left guard, then yeah, put him at left guard. That's yeah. that's fine. Um, All right, next question. Next question is coming from Tim at NYG. Tim, hey, guys, I don't know if you saw this on tape, but in the second quarter at three minutes and 54 seconds left, uh, when Saquon was talking to Dable, if you read his lips carefully, oh, I think he said to read an ad. See, oh, wow, Tim got me. I'm glad. And uh, he got me too. And that's why I put in there. So we had a couple other people say read an ad and they couldn't make it because we only have three ads for this show. So new thing going forward from the mailbag pod. Nico Ryzen, you're, you're grandfathered in with your read an ad questions, right? And I don't want you to get, I don't want you to create if I want your boring. If they're, if they're not boring, I'm, we're not putting them in. But if you want to get in on the mailbag pod with the read an ad, you don't have to do it like that, but just somehow make it funny or whatever. Um, and that's way on. Cause if I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to stop just putting in read and add ones. Like again, you're going to have to get creative. Here's the other thing. That means you might not make it right. Oh, okay. So you can't be sensitive. Don't be sensitive. And like, Oh, you didn't like, like you gotta be, you gotta be willing to be like, Hey, they didn't think that mine that was funny in there. And that goes with that. So you can't be sensitive if we don't pick it. Um, so maybe if you like do it, three times and we don't pick it just kind of have some like hey come to jesus moment like i'm not i'm not funny um or good funny anyways yeah anyways justin read an app today's episode is sponsored by seat geek if you don't know what or just ask a good question you don't have to do do the ad thing no you don't have to like doug analytics i don't want him trying to be funny just ask a good question wow doug analytics is one of the funniest people i know that's very i disagree i think he's very boring wow that's tough for doug analytics he builds he builds bridges um, you know who boring else builds? As fuck. That sounds very boring. You know who else builds builds bridges to help you get places? That's SeatGeek because they're a ticketing app that makes buying tickets super simple. They build metaphorical bridges. Not, I mean, if you think about it, a ticket is a bridge to get you to an event. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. There are more than 70,000 events every single day on SeatGeek, including sports, concerts, festivals, and more. Bobby Skinner is using, using SeatGeek to buy tickets to the Washington Commanders game. Bobby, are you bringing your brother? Breaking news, my brother, a Commanders fan, is coming. I convinced him to come. Okay, because I was going to say, if you are coming alone, then I'll give you I'll give you my ticket next to me, but you're bringing well, That's your why brother. I convinced him, because I was like, I don't want to go to a football game alone. So I was talking with... I, I didn't uh, know... What do you, if, what do you mean? I, I, you, had a, I had a ticket. 
next to but me. But I thought you. I thought you. Like, it was last minute, so I figured somebody. Um, I thought I figured someone had it. So like I I messaged Toe for Pete and I was like, hey, where are you sitting? I want to get close to you. And then he's um, close to but me. Then, then my then my my brother told me no, <laughs> and he just texted me like I'm coming. So I was like, okay, cool. So I didn't have Perfect. to convince him. I just he just changed his mind. I haven't seen Toe for Pete this year. Is he still going to games? Yeah, he's just he kind of does his little tailgate thing. Like he's oh, like, okay. he won't he won't be at the tailgate this week. He's gonna be there with his daughter. No, he uh, but um, he sits he sits in the section next to me, so I always see him at the game. So I haven't oh, seen yeah, he's him. Been in at, he's been at the mall. I've been talking with him. But he's I also, got a new I, pod out, by the way, too. He's got a podcast. Oh, Go check it out. It's I also clashing conferences. I also have been getting to the game really late too, so I haven't been able to see Topher B. And every ticket is backed by their buying guarantee. And SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps, but you won't need that because get your tickets to Giants Commanders and go to the damn game. We've got the hookup. Use code Giants for twenty dollars off your first purchase at SeatGeek. That's twenty dollars off your first purchase with promo code Giants. Click the link in the description to download the app. Bobby Skinner. The final question is coming from Dennis Celery at Yappy Apo ninety nine. Will we finally Dennis hear? Has been kind of an A one from day one, by the way. He has absolutely new new profile picture for Dennis. Will we finally hear back in the New York roof at MetLife Stadium for the first time this regular season? For the first time this regular season on Sunday, yes. So the Giants have not scored a home touchdown yet this year. Um, but also, I have an answer to this. I don't know, and I'm leaning towards no. And this is what? not be- no. This is not because the Giants won't score an offensive touchdown on Sunday. Even though I they am- will, I'm going to be there. We're winning. But I think the Giants might have changed things. I don't know if they play back in the New York Groove after touchdowns anymore. I think that they mix it in. It's like a remix with. Um, oh, that's so stupid. I know they used to play it back like, and they would uh, that would be the only track that would play. Now I think they like mix it into another song, but it doesn't even sound like it. It sounds more like the original, like the sampled song, than back in the New York Groove. So I think they, they we don't we don't we have lost touch with tradition. Yeah, if if and there's a chance that that young person who did made that decision listens to this podcast. You're fucking up. Stop. Like, yeah. do you need to respect tradition? Also, um, do you want to know what else is tradition? Whenever there's a first down, do you know the sound that the stadium makes? In Jacksonville, they go, Row! Nope. No chains. Nope. Nope. We're not Jaguars. Uh, they do, 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 do. They wiped yeah. that away this year. They do not do that again. Dude, and we wonder why we're losing. And that stupid ass logo, they've, they yep. screwed up. Um, I agree. That pisses me off. But we will score a touchdown. I'm going to be there. We're going to win. Or maybe we'll win with four field goals. Did you see the tweet I put out Monday morning? Uh, I feel like it was a slight at me because I've been, that's like what I do I, is I just track. I'm now just tracking how many games. No, how everyone's many quarters. been doing that. Everybody oh. has been doing that. Like, and I, I did it too. I did it like the Giants had the last touchdown with Matt. And, and so I was like, everyone's getting their creative way. Did you see the Giants haven't scored in forever? So I was literally thinking of this way. And I, I thought it was one of my better, like it was joke good. tweets where I said the Giants haven't scored an offensive touchdown since 2014, which is like, there's no, there's one thing to be like, well, why are you lying to your listeners? That is so obvious that no one can believe it. And then I also did Daniel Jones was seven years old and did the picture of him in the Eli Manning jersey. Yep, that was and very that good. May end up being our biggest tweet of the season. Yeah, somebody believed it though. No, well, actually, no one believed it, but there was a couple people who were like, "No," which is very <laughs> funny. No. Um, and then there was a couple of people who would like argue with one, like, that's not true. They scored a touchdown. Like, they're like, oh, Daniel Jones, that doesn't make sense. He would be 16 years old. And I was like, you're right. The last time the Giants did score a touchdown, Daniel Jones was, uh, was 20, <laughs> was 20, was 19 years old. Sorry. Um, or he was 16 the last time. So I, I, th- I thought that was, and I thought about that at like three in the morning. And I was like, can't tweet this at three in the morning. So it was the first thing I tweeted when I woke up. Like I had it in the drafts ready to go. I thought it was very funny. Um, very funny. So so that is an episode. We will see you Friday for a preview pod, baby. We're previewing the Giant First Commanders. They're going to win. And I'm going to be there. I'm thinking about maybe going to like New Egypt or something Saturday night. Let me know if, if, if any listeners oh. or yourself wants to go, Justin. Yeah, that'd um, be great. I, I got to see if they're racing, but anyways, I was just thinking about that. Um, all right. 
We'll see you Friday for a preview pod. Let's win some games. We'll see you then. Until then, let's go Big Blue.